Military simulation-based training has changed quite a bit over the last five or ten years. Uh, today, uh, simulation-based training is very much part of the core training mission, where five or ten years ago uh, it was simply used as a, uh, a device to supplement live training. Uh, today, all training programs have live uh, constructive and virtual components and uh, no training programs today uh, are, are conducted without having elements of all three. And how are the advances in technology help military um, capability and operational readiness? One of the biggest changes over the last few years is, is there is a much broader range of technologies available to support the training mission. Uh, one of the most important, of course, is an airplane itself. Uh, but we supplement the aircraft and live flight training with full flight simulators, very high-end flight training devices, all the ways down to partial task trainers and desktop trainers. What we do is try to look for a solution that comprises all those components to make the training enterprise as efficient as possible. Uh, many military are outsourcing their training. Uh, where do you see that going in the future? Militaries are outsourcing the training. Uh, we, we have to understand that training has always been considered a core mission of the government and in many cases considered an inherently government function. Uh, today the situation has changed and that's simply because uh, of the availability of material and qualified personnel. Uh, with the shortage of pilots in militaries around the world, uh, the desires to try to take those pilots and apply them to operational missions, which leaves a gap in the training enterprise. And that's where we come in. Uh, governments today are more uh, willing to outsource the training mission to companies like CAE, and we take the time to build a training solution to make them comfortable and confident that CAE can take part of that core mission. Will the military uh, start uh, outsourcing, having pilots arrive on their squadrons, limited combat ready, through uh, private training, and then allow the military to do their operational mission training? And we do that today. So there are cases, uh, and there's many different cases, of how governments around the world and militaries around the world are using outsourcing. Uh, in some cases, uh, CAE will supplement their training uh, doing classroom training or maybe simulation-based training. There's other programs where we do live virtual and constructive training, meaning our instructors are in the cockpit with those pilots uh, in the live aircraft. Their next stop is the operational aircraft. And that's where the government personnel, the uniform personnel, will uh, introduce them to the very specific type of aircraft and continue their mission training. Uh, what is the next major focus for, for your company in the next few years? And do you see further changes in military training? I do see changes. I, I think the first, uh, the first focus or the first uh, priority we have is to continue the direction we're going as a training system integrator. We feel very strongly about the, uh, the idea and the strategy to look at the customer's mission uh, and look for that optimal mix of live, virtual, and constructive training to satisfy the mission. Uh, that means that we may be using more live training and we may even be using somebody else's technology to accomplish that mission. So we first emphasize our role <clears throat> as an integrator, uh, not just a technology provider. As we go forward, uh, governments are seeing more and more value in not just the pilot training, but the mission training. And that training has to be increasingly immersive, has to be increasingly interoperable and interconnected. And our ability to do that, to provide the network, the secure networks required to connect all those devices and let the live virtual and constructive elements play together is really what we're working on today and it's the future. So op operational squadrons will be able to do pre-mission, basically fly a pre-mission operation on simulators? They do, and, uh, and they do some of that today. I think we see more and more of that coming. And in fact, uh, when missions are complete, they will also uh, are able to do debriefs on the missions. Uh, we have some cases today where customers will use the simulators not just for training, but for mission preparation and mission rehearsal. They will also then replay the mission back for a, a second group of pilots so they can evaluate and, and learn from the mistakes of others. I understand you do UCAS uh, training as well, unmanned air systems. 
We do. We're, today, we're the biggest provider of training for remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, one of our uh, biggest programs is the program we run for the U.S. Air Force for the MQ-9 series of, uh, of remotely piloted aircraft. That's a great example where we train in the classroom, we train in the simulators, and we do train uh, using live flight training. We've extended that now, and we're building uh, one of the first training centers outside the United States in the Middle East, uh, and we do accomplish many of the same training missions and objectives at that training center. So would, you get, would they get their wings from your training, uh, a UAS operator? They do. So this, uh, this is the qualification training for uh, UAS operators in the U.S. and then in now in other nations. So um, they do come to us with some qualifications and they get ready for our UAS training. Uh, in some cases, those are pilots that are being uh, converted over from other airframes. In, in some cases, this is their uh, initial flight training. So, uh, and I think that's a trend that will continue in the future.